Okay, welcome. Good morning. All right, welcome. Good to see everyone here. I hope you had a great week. Glad that you could all join us this morning for uh, worshiping and just coming to hear God's Word. You know, a lot going on. Hard to believe almost. He's uh, telling, you know, Bonnie, pumpkin spices in the air. If she's got, I th- there's a whisper of pumpkin gobs are going to be on the menu. Maybe I don't want to overload any orders, but if so, she's related to see for sure. I had my first pumpkin, um, pumpkin pie ice cream yesterday. I tried a new place. Eh, it wasn't so good. But uh, either way, I'm getting in that mode. You know, I had to try it out a little bit, but I love pumpkin spice. It's kind of my, uh, my thing, but we're getting close. Anyway, welcome. Glad you could join us this morning. So this morning, we're going to dive right into today's message. You know what I mean? Like, so today's message is a little different, but it's really super important. First of all, many of you may or may not be aware we have done these apologetics events, right, where myself, three other pastors, we have a panel, and then people come in, and they ask us questions about God, the Bible, things they're wrestling with, whatever it might be. And I think it's so key in trying to help people understand more about their faith, right? Because part of the key is not only what do you believe, but why do you believe it, right? If you believe anything, you should have a good reason for believing what you believe. The Gospel talks a little bit about this in, in, in Peter. Uh, and this morning, I want us to really focus on a topic that you probably hear a lot about, if you're paying attention anyways, in news and media and things like that, if anyone brings up about Christianity or God or the Bible, whatever it might be. And the question is, why do you follow Jesus, right? What, what, why do you follow Jesus? What, what did Jesus teach? Because people would say, if you're here this morning, obviously you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus. Why are you a Christian? Why do you follow Jesus? Is it because the Bible says so? Because a pastor said so? Because someone on TV said so? Like, why do you follow him? And the real thing is, why do you follow Jesus over, say, Buddha? Why do you follow Jesus over Muhammad? Why do you follow Jesus over Joseph Smith? Like, there's, there's plenty of people. Why do you follow Jesus over L. Ron Hubbard of Scientology? Like, whatever it might be. Because people today basically say, well, Jesus taught some nice things, but he's just another spiritual teacher like all the other guys, right? He's just the same. That's not true, you know? And today we're going to look at the uniqueness of Jesus. What did Jesus exactly claim? What did he teach? And then what does that leave us for as followers of Jesus Christ? Because I, I submit to you this morning is uh, there are plenty of good reasons to believe what we believe. And we're going to have a little bit of better understanding of what does Jesus claim in Scripture? Because you should know, what does the Bible say about this, right? If someone asks you, you should be, as the Bible says, be ready and willing to give people the reason for the hope that you have. It's scripture-based. And so I just hope this morning you have a better understanding of this because uh, it's definitely different. So kick it off. Um, it would be number one is Jesus' unprecedented claims and demonstration of authority. This is unlike any other spiritual leader or guru out there. This is unique. Some people might say, well, they're all the same. This is not true. So let's begin. What exactly did Jesus claim? Because there are some people out there that says, well, Jesus never claimed to be defined. He was just a nice moral teacher. Um, is that true? I would submit to you the answer that is not true. What does Jesus teach? First of all, he claims cosmic authority. This is certainly true. So for example, go to Matthew 28. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, uh, where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is interesting. He's claiming this cosmic authority. No one else does that. The prophet Muhammad doesn't do that. Joseph Smith doesn't do that. L. Ron Hubbard doesn't do that. Buddha doesn't claim that. This is something unique. Jesus is claiming, right here, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Second thing you need to know about Jesus. What does he teach? He teaches with authority. This is different. This is unique as well. So, for example, go to Mark chapter 1. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teachings because he taught them as one who had authority, not as a teacher of the law. Matthew 5, 38. You, Jesus says, You have heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Verse 43, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is something that actually people are amazed at. He's teaching with authority. This is different. You know, rabbis of the day would always, you know, just say what the law said or recite Old Testament. But Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I tell you. People took issue with this. Who is he to be claiming this kind of unique authority? Um, who, who, who does that? For no first century Jew would do that. And Jesus here is teaching with authority. It's different. People are impressed by that. People are like, 
Some people were very angered by that. Who does this guy think he is teaching like this? So he claims cosmic authority. No one else does that. He teaches with a, this unique authority, which again, he, he's in a seemingly trumping what has been heard before. You better be careful about doing that. You've heard it said, but I tell you. Very interesting. And now also he claims authority on earth to forgive sins. This is also very unique. So go to Mark 2. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and t your mat and take and walk? But I want you to know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to them, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Now this is big, too, because every first century Jew, Jew would know only God can forgive sins, right? So if anyone, this is a little kind of nugget, if anyone ever says Jesus never claimed to be divine, this kind of subtly does claim that because they would know only God can forgive sins. And here Jesus is claiming to forgive sins and they were outraged. Verse 7, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right, so right there, that should be an inclination. There is a claim to divinity there. And again, do you see anyone else in history claiming this stuff? No, you don't. So I, I just say these things because you, number one, should know what actually Jesus claims, right? You should know what the Bible says because there's plenty of people out there that says, no, Jesus never claimed to be divine. He never claimed anything special. Um, and that, that would be false. And so just know that. There are very, very unique claims here that Jesus is setting out. Um, also, another one, Jesus claims oneness with the Father. This is interesting. So go to John 10. I and the Father are one. John 14. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So there's this uniqueness here. He's claiming oneness with the Father. Uh, another one that's very interesting is he claims before Abraham was, I am. This is a big one. This one right here, if anyone ever says, no, Jesus never claimed to be divine, this is a great verse to point to. So John 8, are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and were glad. You are not yet fifty years old, they said to him. And you have seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up some stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. And so this is a profound one, right? So first of all, that phrase, I am, if you're familiar with the Bible, who is the great I am? That's God, right? Yahweh, Adonai. And so this phrase, I am, certainly a first century Jew would hear this to be a divine claim. And then he's saying, what, before Abraham was born, I am. And they said, wait a second, you existed before Abraham? You're not even 50 years old yet. He's claiming pre-existence there, right? And so just know this. This verse alone is very profound in getting to the root of Jesus' claims of divinity. Um, to forgive sins, to um, the I am, uh, before Abraham was born, I existed. So all these different things, just take it in your mind and say, okay, wait a second, Jesus certainly is making some unique claims here. And no other religious guru claimed to have a vision or a message from God made these kind of claims. This is standing out. And so just know that. If anyone ever says, well, Jesus kind of is just another teacher, makes the same claims, absolutely not. Uh, this is, again, uh, this is what got him crucified, really. Going around preaching, love your neighbor and be, do good, that's not going to get you killed. Proclaiming to be the Son of God, the Messiah, the King of the Jews, yeah, that'll do it. And, I mean, right above his head, the charge of the crime, what? Jesus, King of the Jews. That's what they did in the Roman Empire. This is what you're charged. This is what you're being crucified for. Um, uh, and, and so they have took it as an insurrection kind of a thing, the Roman Empire. But nevertheless, just know this. So, okay, here's the claims, but now anyone can make claims. 
does the evidence back these claims up? That's where you got to get to. So he makes unique claims versus anybody in all of human history. All right, does he back it up? Because actually, there's been other people in history that claim to be the Messiah. There, I remember hearing a story um, uh, one time a pastor said that, you know, Jesus, uh, or not Jesus, a, a guy came to his church and claimed to be Jesus. And he's like, all right, let's, 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 let's see if it's true. And he asked the guy, where were you born? And the guy said, Pittsburgh. <laughs> well, right away you're out, because the last time I checked, that's not the tribe of Benjamin or where you needed to come from. So, you know, and so, okay, let's see how the evidence stacks up. Is this according to what prophecy said and, and some unique claims here? Uh, because, again, if Jesus' claims hold true, if, if his evidence supports that, then his teachings on origin, meaning, morality, destiny, which every worldview has to answer, even atheism, has to be taken seriously because he has that authority. One of the things, again, that's unique about Jesus is um, the blameless life of, life of Jesus. No other person in history has this kind of thing associated with them. So go to Hebrews 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne with grace and confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Another good reason to follow Jesus, the blameless life. This says, listen, he's been through it. He's been tempted in every way. If you think, oh, he doesn't know what I've been through, like, yeah, no, he's been tempted in every way, it says. Uh, and so this is not a God who exempted himself from, he could have exempted himself and not experienced the brokenness of the world or pain or suffering or humiliation or rejection, but no, this God enters into human um, brokenness, suffers, right? And so this is something that's very profound because what kind of God does this? You know, he doesn't exempt himself. He enters into the dirtiness and muck of broken humanity for us. Uh, and it says he's been through it. And Jesus has this reputation of, of, of a perfect life, never giving in to that. Uh, and just, I think it's important to see that because uh, I think, too, most people that aren't Christians that are critical of Jesus would be very surprised, actually, at his teachings, you know? Um, sometimes people that are critical of Jesus, they cherry pick a few verses out and say, look, like, the Bible and Christianity is against mm, women. It's like, well, really? Well, let's look at how Jesus actually interacts with women. And he shows women unbelievable mercy and grace and compassion in a culture that didn't always do that. You know, the woman at the well, remember that? Uh, this is unbelievable. He was talking to a woman who had a sordid past, uh, in daylight, in public, first of all, that's a big taboo in that culture. You do not talk to a woman in public that's not your wife. There would have been like, people would have been disgusted about that. Jesus didn't care. Jesus said, I'm breaking the social norms because I want to extend mercy and grace and compassion to a woman who is marginalized. He does the same thing to the woman with the issue of blood, you know? First of all, woman issue the blood, touching him. Remember, she wants healing. She touches him. That right away would have been a big no-no because now he would have been, in the religious eyes, considered unclean. And, and also, a woman touching him and not married in public, it would have been a big scandal. The religious people were in an uproar. Jesus couldn't care less. Why? He looks past that nonsense of religion nonsense, and he sees a woman who's in need, and he says, what an amazing testimony your faith was, right, in touching him. And so people would be surprised. Jesus, he actually criticizes the religious elite, the conservatives of the day, the Pharisees and Sadducees, and teaches the law, and he enters and eats with the marginalized, the tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes. So most people that would criticize Jesus actually be very surprised that actually the, the real Jesus is the Bible, you know? And, and he's one who is for his people, mercy, grace, love, and compassion. And so just make sure well, you don't lose that in the mix, because this is unique that many people wouldn't even realize. So you have unique claims, you have this uniqueness, but also a big one is Jesus' authority to heal infirmities and drive out demons. Do you see any other of these people with these claims, right? Um, Buddha never claimed that. Joseph Smith and Muhammad and, and L. Ron Hubbard, all these people that, that people follow, religious gurus. No, this is unique to Jesus. Now I will say this, is just doing these miracles and whatnot, alone in and of itself isn't maybe enough to prove his um, messianic uh, um, title, uh, you know, because we know in the, even in the Bible there were people going around doing miracles and, and healings and things like that. Um, two things are happening there. Either one, people are doing things 
um, with dark arts, because people are told to not get into like witchcrafts and things like that, because it's a very dangerous area. And there are some people too doing it as charlatans, trying to fool people and whatnot. That's why Jesus even says that people are going around doing things in my name, let them do them, because they're of us, you know. Uh, but this is interesting, because he has a unique authority that really, really confuse people even of the day. So for example, go to John 6. Some time after this, Jesus crossed the far, the, the far of the shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he performed by healing the sick, Luke 23. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sorts. And Matthew 12, then they brought him in, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. So what's interesting is this. Even his people that are against him, the Pharisees, don't deny he's doing amazing things. They admit he's doing amazing things. They just say he's doing it by the power of Satan, right? And Jesus says, well, that's ridiculous because how can um, a kingdom divided cannot stand, right? How can darkness drive out darkness? Uh, and, and so uh, it, he's well known for doing these amazing things. Uh, people are amazed by them because they're far beyond anything they've seen. And even as people who are against them can't explain it, and they don't deny he's doing them. They just say, well, he's doing it by the power of Satan, right? And so this is very unique as well because this is now saying, wait a second, anyone can claim anything. But now if you're doing something that's showing authority and power, remember Jesus calms a storm and they were terrified, even his own followers. Now it's like, whoa, something is going on here. Uh, and even think about James, his brother. You know, remember early on, said his family thought he was kind of crazy, and then eventually James became a follower of one of the leaders of the early church. What would it take to convince you your brother was the Messiah as a first century Jew? A lot. And clearly something happened to James where he was convinced. Um, but nevertheless, just know this, that this is going on. And I say too is, I've, I've told you a story before about professors of mine who, um, I have a professor in particular who's been in the military, but also he was a, a very high professor and written books and leader at, at Ashland Theological Seminary. And his encounters with the spiritual realm and demons and how the demons have to listen to the authority of the name of Jesus and the things that, you know, again, not just personality thing, I mean things flying across the room or whatever, like spiritual warfare stuff, that alone says, hey, this is the real deal, right? When they respond, you know, there's even clinical studies where people that are in, um, in wards and whatnot, and they won't respond to any treatment or whatever, but yet they, a, a priest or pastor goes in there and something happens when there's a response. Um, something more is going on here than just the medical condition. Um, but nevertheless, different topic altogether. Just know there is authority in the name of Jesus. Jesus demonstrates his authority, and it's unique unlike anybody else in all of human history. Um, because again, this is just really important to, to see. It's, it's another piece of the puzzle. Not just, it's not in and of itself, but it's a piece of the puzzle that says, listen, Jesus is not like everybody else. He makes unique claims. He does unique things that people can't even explain and unique authority. And, and something else is, is going on here. And of course, as Christians, what is the hallmark telltale thing that sets it apart above his shoulders, that he is the Messiah. Of course, that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the big thing. Even top scholars, even skeptics say, you know what? Something had to have happened because uh, the resurrection is the only reason they can give to why Christianity even got off the ground and lasted like it did because there's no other explanation. And we'll have more on that in a second. Um, N.T. Wright, top biblical scholar, um, talks about this. He actually wrote an 800-page book for the historical evidence of Jesus Christ. Uh, and he gave it to his professor when he was doing his, I think, doctorate or postdoctorate work, or whatever it might have been. And the professor was a skeptic and said, amazing, sound case. I don't have any explanation for it. You made a good case. I just choose to believe there has to be another explanation. And he said, okay, that's fine. I can't bully you into it, but just know the evidence is there that Jesus Christ has been raised again. This is not just some pie in the sky, hoping, wishing thing. And we'll go more on that in a second. So Luke chapter one, 
Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who uh, from first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. 2 Peter 1, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we were told to you the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And 2 Peter 2, Remember, Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal, but God's word is not chained. And 1 Corinthians 15, now, brothers and sisters, I want you to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you are received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, and he appeared to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, it means they've died. Then he appeared to James, then the other apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as one abnormally born. The evidence of the resurrection is so profound. These are eyewitness people and early on people saying, listen, this is not a myth. This isn't, we've seen it. We, this is Paul saying, Paul was writing this, right? And he's writing people, think about this. He's writing and saying, listen, he appeared to 500 or more at one time. He's saying, some of us are still alive. If you don't believe, go and talk to them, right? Go and talk. People would have reading this would have, okay, go talk to them. And think about Paul who hated Christians, crucified Christians, right? Had them persecuted, meaning. Um, he said, now a, a Christian writer, what would cause Paul to do a 180? Well, he tells you right here. The risen Jesus appeared to him. He experienced the resurrected Christ. And so this is not something that happened in a dark corner. This is something where Paul's saying, listen, he appeared to many, many, many people. Um, this is carefully investigated. Some are, many are still alive. You can go talk to them. But just know, what is, we've been there before, the gospel, good news. What is it? Jesus Christ crucified, right, risen again. This is my gospel. And I just say that because any church that does not have that as the focus, your red flag should go up, right? If, they do not, if, if it's just more about having your best life now and self-help and being blessed and getting rich and all of that, that's not the gospel. That's Tony Robbins stuff. Like you can get that from Tony Robbins, right? The God, he says, this is my gospel. Now, it doesn't mean that God's word doesn't say anything about that. He wants you blessed and wants you succeeding and all of that, of course. But it isn't the gospel. If, you, if a church does not preach Christ crucified, risen again, and also the call to repent, to turn from sins and turn to Christ, then I don't know what they're teaching, but uh, I mean, it's clear. This is my gospel. This is the gospel, right? Uh, this is why they were going around teaching and preaching and, and all of that. It wasn't about having your best life now, as some people might want to read books on and make millions of dollars off of. Um, but nevertheless, I just say important to, you might not like it, I don't care. <laughs> you know, it's just what it says. It's just what it says. Um, and, and that's just really important to, to realize because the resurrection is the center of why Christianity got off the ground. It is what took his followers who went from this group of scared, kind of unsure people huddled in the upper room to a group that went out and transformed the world saying, no, no, he has overcome the grave. He has been risen again. Sin has been dealt with. Satan has been defeated. And we saw it. And, and, and we know what they got for him. They were killed for, for doing that. Also, too, just know, guess what? Maybe just the Bible doesn't say that. Other historians outside of the Bible record these events. Ancient historians like Josephus and Suetonius and Tacitus, these are just ancient his historical scholars uh, they all record that Jesus lived, that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and very early on his followers went around proclaiming he'd been raised again. So anyone that says this is myth or not rooted in history, frankly, doesn't know what are talking about because uh, it was, it, this, these events happened, you know? Uh, and so it's important that we, that we realize that. Um, also, too, we have fulfilled prophecy. This is a big thing, too, that fulfilled prophecy talked about the coming Messiah, and Jesus filled all these predictions. Predictions... 
a uh, thousand years or more before Jesus. Jesus comes, remember when he goes in the synagogue and Jesus undoes the scroll and reads from Isaiah uh, and the people are outraged because Jesus says that, that those sitting there is, are, is, is being fulfilled in your midst, essentially. You know, they were outraged. Who does this guy think he is? He's saying this has been written about and it's pointing to that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would come and this is what would happen. And another thing that we don't see from any other spiritual gurus of the day, really important. Losing my voice, but we're almost there. Bear with me. Uh, so, okay, teaching with authority, backing up the claims, the resurrection that has profound historical evidence. Then what are the options? And what do we do with this? Uh, well, there's really several options. We'll go through one at a time, but I'll give him a heads up. He's either, uh, he's either crazy uh, he's the, don't go, just stay right there, don't go through them all, but he's either crazy, he, it's either a myth, it's a lie, or it's the truth. That's really, that's the only options you have, right? So, is he crazy? That's the first one. Is he a crazy man, right? Does this guy just, anyone can go around claiming anything, you know? Is he just wearing his tinfoil hat, you know? Maybe turning too much water into wine, is that what's going on here? I, what, what, why is he making these claims? Is he crazy? Some people say this guy's crazy. I would just say people say he's crazy, it doesn't line up because what do you do with things like his miracles, like the resurrection, like his followers going around making these claims that they've seen all of this? So just saying, because anything, anyone can say anything, but to back it up is different, right? That's why they cited fulfilled prophecy. They cited the miracles. They cited the resurrection. Uh, and so when really the early followers were early apologists, they were giving the reasons for why they believe what they believe, and it took a lot to convince many people. So the crazy idea doesn't fit because it still doesn't give answers to the miracles and the resurrection and, and all of that. What about a myth? Is this a myth? I would submit to you, no, it does not fit being a myth. Um, why does it not fit being a, a, a myth? Well, again, um, we have many sources outside of the Bible that talk about Jesus' life, crucifixion and followers. Uh, it's not just a made-up thing, it's in history. Um, uh, secondly, you don't really have the culture for myths like this to develop. A first century Jew would be very devout, and for anyone to claim anyone to be divine or the Messiah or whatever it might be, it is not something anyone would do because they weren't expecting a Messiah. They weren't, or they weren't expecting a crucified Messiah. Remember? Remember when he, Jesus was telling Peter he's going to go to Jerusalem and go to the cross? He said, no, Lord, never. And Jesus said, away from me, Satan, get behind me. Right? Uh, and they were in the upper room after the crucifixion, wondering, what do we do? Is this the end? What happened to our, our leader? You know? And so there's not this culture for it. And even, I think even more impressively, you don't have the time for a myth. Myths take hundreds, if not thousands of years to develop. And we know from early sources that very early on within the lifetime we have documentation that his followers are going around saying he was raised again. This wasn't something that popped up thousands of years later. That, oh yeah, he's, he's alive now. No. Eyewitness accounts. Early eyewitness accounts. You know? And I think it's really important to see. Uh, and some people say, well, is it kind of like a telephone game where you say one thing and then down the line it's changed by the time it ends? I say no. Why? Uh, two things. Number one, with scripture, we know scripture was very, very meticulously copied. The, the, the parameters that you had to be a scribe and to write things were unbelievable. One of the biggest evidences came, I think it was 1926, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And when they found that, they found a copy of the Old Testament that was two, or, yeah, the Old Testament that was um, 2,000 years earlier than any previous copy we had. And what they found was the accuracy of transmission was like 98 or 99 percent identical because they were so meticulous in copying the text over the years. Uh, and the only differences were like a punctuation mark or a letter missed, or maybe the scribe looked at the, letter, the line below versus the line up. It didn't change the core meaning of what was written in terms of transmission of scriptures. Also, too, um, in cultures that many couldn't read or write, oral culture where they would um, read things and say things out loud, even in some cultures use it today, they're very, very, very accurate because that's what they do. That's how they live. And so just know you don't have the culture, you don't have the time, um, anything that, that fits the whole idea of, of a myth by any means. Um, real quick, some people say, well, the body was stolen, right? That's an explanation. The body was stolen. 
I, nope, I don't think that's the answer. Why? Well, the Bible says, number one, there was a guard placed there so the, the body, body couldn't be stolen. Uh, secondly, even if someone somehow stole the body, you still have a dead body. What do you do with the accounts of people experiencing the risen Jesus over a period of 40 days? What do you do with them touching his side? And, and they actually said they touched him. You know, what do you do with the ascension? That doesn't explain the gospel accounts of what happened, the stolen body. Then some people say, well, he really wasn't dead. You know, <laughs> again, I don't think that fits the story. Why? What do we know? Number one, Roman soldiers were professional killers. They did this all day, every day. They knew how to kill. And if they would have failed, they would have been killed, right? They were brutal killers. And so they knew what they were doing. Uh, also, too, uh, the idea that he really wasn't dead doesn't fit because even the accounts, remember the spear in the side, it says water and blood flowed from the spear in Jesus' side. Modern day doctors so say that's exactly what happened if the, the, the pericardium around the heart was punctured. You would see this water come out with the blood. No one's surviving that, you know. And, and so you have all of these ideas. Not only that, what do you do with Jesus apparently appearing in a room? And what do you do with Jesus' ascension afterwards? That doesn't fit this whole thing of, well, he really wasn't dead. It doesn't explain that. So what's the next option? People say, well, maybe he was raised spiritually, you know, just like it means he went to heaven. It was like hyperbole or something like that. No, um, we know there's different words in Scripture they use, and, and resurrection, this is a word means to new life. It wasn't like they did CPR on him or whatever it means. New resurrection life that he got. Uh, and also, too, we know they, they, they said they touched his sides when he came back. He appeared in the room. He ascended. Uh, all of these kind of things that talk about that we've already been through. Uh, that doesn't fit that bill as well. Then some people say, well, maybe it was like a mass hallucination kind of a thing, where they were all just, cause we know there have been um, reports of mass hallucinations and things. And again, I say it does not fit the bill either, because this is over a period of 40 days or so. Um, we see Paul saying 500 or more people, plus other people and times. It just does not fit that bill. And there's some people say, there's actually, there's actually a theory going on out there. People say, well, I think people were on mushrooms, and they were tripping and hallucinating. This is a theory out there. This is a wild one. They say, well, in that culture, there was a mushroom that grew that we know if you ate it, it would give you psychedelic experiences. Again, that, now you're reaching for straws, you know what I mean? Because, again, Paul's account of 500 or more, other people over 40 days, touching the side, all, plenty of things. I just say this is, um, when people meet the evidence and you don't want to believe, you'll find any excuse not to believe. And we see this happen in, in just on any topic, really. You can tell people all the evidence, and it's right there in black and white, and people are going to believe what they want to believe, right? People are going to dismiss that. If they don't want it to be true, then nothing you tell them is going to satisfy, satisfy that. Uh, so I think it's important to think. Then the next thing is, is it a lie? So um, is this a possibility? Were they lying about it? I would submit to you, the answer would be no. Uh, again, it's not, number one, this is not a, a lie first century Jew would make up. They were very devout people. They took the faith very seriously. Uh, they would you know, not do this, doesn't make any sense. Uh, also, you, there's no way to get away with this lie because you had Roman authorities that would quickly want to squash this because you don't want this going around. And we even see that in the Bible. They try to cover up a lie and tell them the body was stolen because they don't want it getting out. You know, um, also you have eyewitnesses that would say, listen, I was there, it didn't happen. Let me take you to him. Here, there he is. He's, I, I, I didn't see nothing. So there's no way they get around with it. And then the real big one is when you make up a lie, you're usually trying to get something out of it. You're getting a benefit some way. What did they get from proclaiming this? We know they were killed brutally. And we know this from historians outside of the Bible too, right? It's not the Bible just saying it. Historians talk about the brutal killing of Christians they were going around proclaiming this, even the early eyewitnesses. And uh, so if you're going to go to all this, right, as a first century Jew, and then still proclaim this, knowing you're going to be killed, you're not gaining anything out of it, unless it was true, which is what they said. We experienced the eye, we were eyewitnesses to his majesty and power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Uh, now some people might say, well... Some people might die for a lie. Like, for example, the people that flew the planes and the towers in 9-11, they really believed they were going to go to paradise, right? Here's the difference is, these people in the Bible were in a position to know whether it was true or not. 
They were early accounts. They were eyewitnesses. They were friends of eyewitnesses, right? People flying the planes in the world train, they have no idea. They were just, you know, they were thousands of years removed. You know, these people that we're talking about, they are in a position to know whether it was true or not. Early eyewitness accounts is very, very key. And so I think this is really important to realize. It doesn't line up. Uh, any, any of these things. And so there's no motivation for doing it because they know they were brutally killed, uh, tortured actually, even outside of the Bible talks about this. And lastly, what is the other option? Well, it's truth. It is the truth that Jesus Christ fulfilled prophecy. He came, made amazing, unique claims unlike anybody else. He did amazing, unique things unlike anybody else. Uh, and he was raised again unlike anybody else, overcoming death, overcoming the grave, overcoming Satan, overcoming sin. You know, all the other people, Buddha, Joseph Smith, Muhammad, guess what? They're still in the grave. Jesus, the grave could not hold him, right? That's why he says about the resurrection. So, see, I think it's Revelation of Thessalonians, that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope, right? Because Christ has been risen again. That's a beautiful thing. That is the gospel. Never forget that. Never forget that at all. And so as we think about today, I guess say it's really important for all of you, all of us as Christians, especially in this culture and world, to know not only what you believe, but why you believe it. There is solid evidence for that. Because in a world that's going to try to say all religions are the same, all religious teachers are the same, Jesus was just some kind of moral teacher or, or religious teacher or crazy guy or liar or like whatever it might be. He never claimed to be divine or whatever you hear out there. Just know. Now you know. That's not true. You know, now you know the uniqueness of Jesus and the one we serve. But I also say too, that's not enough, is are you a follower of Jesus? Are you a disciple of Jesus? You know, um, when he stood before um, Pilate, when he stood before him, when he stood before Herod, all these leaders, one of the questions that was asked is, um, what is truth? What is the truth? Remember that question they asked Jesus? What is truth? And there the embodiment of truth stood before him. They still didn't want to see it, couldn't see it. And so I just say that even though we all sin and fail and make mistakes, we don't want to get into a place in our lives where we see the uniqueness of Jesus, we see his authority, we see his love and power, and yet we still don't follow him as disciples because Christian means you're a follower of Jesus. doesn't mean you're perfect. I'm not perfect. You know, I'm far from perfect. I, I, know, I don't try to pretend I'm perfect. I'm just a regular person. I sin, I struggle, we all do. But the problem is when a Christian gets to the point, some Christians get to the point where you're like, I know what God's word says about something and I don't care. I'm still going to live my life this way. I know God's word says this about marriage. I know God's word says about this, about um, my behavior or my sin or my language or my thoughts or how I treat people or how I, you fill in the blank and I'm still going to do this. And otherwise, I think it's a dangerous place to be because we're called to what? Repent means turn and believe. And we do that because God loves you and, and the more you hold on and try to be God of your own life and resist God, it leads to bad things, you know? That's why God is saying, listen, sin destroys. It's not I'm trying to be this cosmic kill joy I'm trying to save you because I created you. I love you. I want what's best for you. I died for you because I want you to know who I am. And so I just know that, that he loves you. You have a purpose, but he's also calling you to walk with him because he wants you to walk with him. And that's, a, that's an amazing thing to think about. The creator of the universe, this unique Jesus, unlike anything in history, has gone through extreme measures for you and me. How do we respond on a daily basis? Yeah, we must sin and struggle, but we still want to move forward. We're allowing God to transform us. We're walking with him and seeing the blessings that come from following him, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for everybody here. God, I just pray that everyone here can see the beauty and uniqueness of Jesus and the love of what you've done through your son, Jesus Christ. And if you're here this morning and you're not sure how you are with your relationship with God, Maybe you have never made that commitment to follow Jesus. Maybe you didn't know. Maybe you're not sure how things would go if you stood before God right now. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you want to call out to God now to save you, you just raise your hand. No one will know. I will know. You will know. God will know. 
and we'll, we'll, we'll pray a prayer silently. No one will know about it. With heads bowed, eyes closed, if you want to ask God to save you, never have, you can raise your hand and do that now, knowing that God is seeking you, that God loves you, and has gone through extreme measures. You don't got to be ashamed about it. Just know there's no time to wait because of who God is and what He does. You can just put your hand up and no one else will know it's between you and God and we'll do that. Or even so, you can say that prayer in your heart silently. But Father God, I thank you for everybody here. We thank you that we serve a unique God, an amazing God, a God that defies all logic and understanding and reasoning of what people think a God of the universe would do. But yet here we are revealed in Jesus and we know that the evidence is there. And help us to see, anytime anyone tries to lump Christianity in, or Jesus in other religions or teachers, we, we can say, and I'll say, no, no, that is not true. This is different. This is why it's different. And this is why we are followers of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God, guide us, lead us, forgive us for our sins. We've all fallen short. We need your mercy and grace. Let us go out of these doors more committed to actually taking your word seriously and being actual disciples, followers of you, by biblical definition, not just because we believe intellectually, because how we actually orient our lives and even how we're going to be obedient, even if we maybe don't feel like it, because we're going to do it because in faith is still saying, I am going to in faith obey, trust and obey God because he knows his best and loves me. And uh, you're there for our benefit, our protection. We thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen.